let's keep this swan princess train going with the ninth movie in the series, Kingdom of Music. La, 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 la. Do you want to know why I light up the sky? Day or night, it doesn't matter. I fly so high. I so we open this movie on... What is there even to talk about? I don't want to keep repeating myself in these intros because barely anything has changed. Though something that is new at this point is Odette's voice actor, Nina Herzog, who will play the character for the rest of the series. But at this point, the movies feel the same. So let's just get this one over with since there's more to look at. Good. Now then, we open this movie on... A new location! The Cathay Empire. Yes, we have apparently moved from whatever medieval land we normally were in and arrived in medieval China, or this universe's version of it. Here there are clones aplenty. There's even one of them walking in place before we zoom in. That's the level of nitpicking I've resorted to. You happy, Richard Rich? Inside a hidden chamber, we see a woman eavesdropping on a conversation between the Emperor, voiced by George Hu, and his son, Prince Li, voiced by Francis Huang. They're talking about a music competition, yes, really, that the Prince is going to compete in. So they conduct some ritual to remind him that he can't let any personal ventures get in the way of victory. If only your sister shared your wisdom. Well, that's pretty mean. Is it not possible that I know your feelings are tender for her, Lee? Um... Lee is also given a gift to deliver to the Swan Princess. The Princess, Mei Li, voiced by Stephanie Shea, then gets an interesting idea and decides to share it with... a dragon? <laughs> Ugh, I get that it's someone turned into a dragon, but I'm just reminded of the Will Smith fish from Shark Tale. But yeah, this is Chen, voiced by Alexandra Chen, who Mei Li is in love with. She tells him that she's planning to secretly follow her brother to meet the Swan Princess and see if she could help with breaking the spell that turns Chen into a dragon. This curse seems similar to Odette's, because whereas Odette only turns back to normal when the moon is out, Chen can only turn back to normal when it's sunset. We will never break the spell. It's time for me to go far away, so you will be free. What, you afraid someone will be scared of that face? We then cut over to the Emperor, talking to the Sorceress who put the spell on Chen. He's thinking about getting rid of it, but this is what she has to say. Only your child can break it. But surely you can- I can do nothing! What the hell does that mean? Anyway, as Prince Lee prepares to leave, Mei Li tries to sneak aboard his ship. She causes a distraction with fireworks, which only distracts the crowd, before attempting to sneak into a wooden basket. But one of the guards notices footprints leading to the chest and suspects something. Juan Prince Lee, tell him to get below deck. <laughs> wow, give that man a reward for doing his job properly. But Mei Li gets on the ship at the end, largely through Chen's help once her cover is blown. She gets extra help from Lee's servant Ru, voiced by Ben King, who is also turning a blind eye on her sneaking aboard and is distracting Prince Lee. Shen also follows from above. Not sure how he didn't get spotted, but whatever. Well, this is a better cold opening from what we saw last movie. Got some good setup and even a little action. After the usual credits and water swirl animation, we cut to Queen Uberna complaining about Prince Lee and his late arrival. Meanwhile, Rogers is giving a castle tour for four of the five finalists in this upcoming music competition. Animal could walk and talk to humans? Why, of course! In our kingdom, animals walk and talk all the time. Well, it's nice of them to actually lampshade this. And the guests just accept it, since they see Puffin and some scullions setting up the theater where the competition will take place. But where is the sign hanging from? What's the rope above the sign connected to? Either way, Rogers tries showing up the acoustics of the place by doing this. <laughs> what did I tell you? Perfect. <laughs> you almost killed Puffin. We then cut over to Elise and Lucas. I guess this movie takes place years after the last movie, since those two are all grown up now. This also means that Elise is now voiced by Blue Essen, while Lucas is still voiced by Grant DeRosso. If I have to put a number on the time skip, 
I'd put it at at least 10 years. Lucas has been teaching people how to grow tulips, even in countries that don't have any. Elise also learned to play the harp, and the upcoming music competition is meant to be a preamble to her coming-of-age ball. Naturally, she wants Lucas to attend. Not only that, she even writes in his name on her dance card, only behind her adoptive father. They spend some time reminiscing about their shared childhood before they head over to the docks to greet Prince Lee. Lee gives Odette the present, but Elise messes up by giving him a cattail. Is it common to laugh at another's <laughs> misfortune in this kingdom? It is not. It is a trifle. My father taught me an emperor who cannot abide ridicule cannot abide the throne. Now that is how a future king behaves. I don't know. Odette and Derek are a little more open-minded than that. That night, Lucas asks Roger if Elise would ever marry a regular guy, meaning him. And I guess it's because of the last scene, but Rogers assures him that he has a chance. This is where Mei Li sneaks off the boat and proceeds to stealthily make her way into the castle using whatever tricks she has. Derek spots Dragon Chen and thinks it's a dangerous monster, so... <laughs> Forgiveness for our intrusion. We mean no harm. Well, it's a good thing they understood all that. If they didn't, we'd have a different movie. Mei Li explains her situation, and Odette and Derek are eager to help, and to keep her presence here a secret. At the same time, Prince Lee is given a tour of the castle and isn't enjoying himself. This causes him to speak poorly about the cookie he had from Ferdinand, which causes him to butt heads with Elise. In my country, honesty is a most important virtue. Perhaps it is not the same here. We value honesty as much as you or any country does. But we also value manners. Yeah, she doesn't like Lee that much. But if this is meant to parallel how Odette and Derek first saw each other, I think we know what's coming. Speaking of, Odette and Derek witnessed Chen's transformation and now must figure out how to break that spell. When we broke the spell, I was lying right here because, well, because you flew here as a swan. But then you transformed, and you died. Wait, how do the other royals know of the Swan Princess story? And did they just accept it at face value? Now, this attempt at breaking the spell based on personal experience is kind of funny, because this time it's a man who is under the spell. So Mei and Chen switch roles in recreating the dynamic between Odette and Derek. But, um, if Derek freed Odette from her swan form by killing Rothbard, does the same have to happen to the sorceress? Hmm. Our heroes think to ask Scully for help. But we transition to the start of the music competition. There is some fairly creative use of the Scullians who are casting shadows over the screen to welcome everyone. Okay, I'll let you have this one. And now, our festival finalists. Ah! Our feet are melted to the floor! From Indus. Sama from Kievan Rus. Anya from Azania. Kumbalani from San Salamanca. Isabella. So, in this universe, each country just has their own kingdom? Man, this dazzling opening only makes me wish for their old 2D stuff. Not that it was the best, because Trumpet of the Swan exists, but it would be far more presentable than their attempts at 3D animation. Odette then gives a speech about how ever since the first movie, she vowed to celebrate love through this yearly music festival. That will never be mentioned again, I guess. Each contestant gets one performance, and the winner will get to sing for Elise's coming-of-age ball. As for judges, we have Uberta, Rogers, and Jean Bob. What about Jean Bob, a handsome prince? The festival begins with Ferdinand juggling a bunch of knives, and it's pretty good. But that's just an opening act that gives way to the first contestant, Humbalani, voiced by Yahash Bonner who puts on an African-inspired show. Give it to me! Give 
right to me. Give me attention rapidly. Give me attention. Give me attention. Give me attention. Listen to me. Now, my only concern with any of these songs is how they're meant to represent cultures of different nationalities. Humbalani's song is fine to listen to, but just keep in mind that Africa, the continent, has many different musical cultures and traditions that might not be captured well here, because I don't know if they or any of the other cultures presented here were ever consulted. Either way, everyone seems to like the performance, except Sean Bob. I think it was a little pitchy. <gasps> That's how you get the ratings, baby. <laughs> The ratings say we have 0% viewers! Hold on! No one was watching our show? Now there's a surprise! Elise tries telling Lucas that she wants anyone but Prince Lee to win the competition. They can't hear each other well because it's too loud, so Elise has to repeat herself and... Anyone but Prince Lee! Well, that's just rude. Huberta tells her adopted granddaughter to apologize to Lee, while Rue also convinces the prince to stay focused on his task. Both of them meet the next day in an attempt to reach an understanding, and it becomes something a little more when Lee notices the harp next to Elise. He shows that he's pretty good with the instrument, causing Elise to play along with him. Well, at least they're starting to find common ground. All the while, Lucas is watching from a distance and is just confused about what just happened. Back over to Odette and Derek, they go over other possible cures for Chen's curse with Scully. If the vow of everlasting love doesn't work, how about a true love's kiss? Oh, many times. Thousands of times. All right then. Magic potions it is. Scully finds a section dedicated to humans turning into dragons and notes that a possible cure involves dragon blood. They can't seem to draw some from Chen given his hard scales, though I don't think his face is as protected, but that gives Derek an idea. Too bad we don't know what the idea is yet because we're back in the music competition. The next performance is from Anya, voiced by Emily Pearson. She's from a fictional Kevin Ross, which is the precursor to several Eastern European states like Russia and Ukraine in real life. So naturally, she sings while ice skating and making mention of various Russian places like Moscow or the Volga River. Eh, not bad. Though the art direction for the series still isn't something that's my cup of tea. We get a brief break when Elise takes the contestants to where Lucas grows a bunch of flowers. Lucas then gives everyone a tulip, and the one for Lee is bent at the top. Lee takes this in stride, though. No, no. This is good. In my country, when you give someone a broken flower, it reminds them that we live among broken people. Oh, now you're starting to be more humble? I guess Elise is rubbing off him faster than I thought. Back over to the other plot, Derek shoots one of Chen's scales and causes the dragon to bleed a little. He manages to draw blood that Mei catches to create the remedy. She then feeds said remedy to her beloved, and... Nope, still a dragon. Guess it's time for Scully to look at the actual spell and see how it works. But enough of that, more knockoff American Idol! Next up is Isabella, voiced by Rebecca Lopez. And like the first one, only Jean Bob doesn't like it because he's just a glutton for hate, isn't he? Uberta has the best comeback. Afterwards, Lee and Elise sneak off to talk a little more about themselves. Elise reveals that she's the adopted daughter of Derek and Odette, though she views both as father and mother and loves them for it. Lee reveals that his mother died young and that while he loves his father, he does take issue with his strictness, particularly when said strictness was directed towards his sister Mei Lee. It's another nice moment of bonding where both are slowly developing feelings for each other, and even Odette and Derek notice from a distance. Rue also catches on that Lee is in love. How old was he then? Just your age, Master Lee. Eighteen. Well, at least they're close to adulthood. Lucas feels threatened by Lee and asks for help from Rogers. 
Here is where he learns that Elise wants him to dance with her at her coming of age ceremony, and Rogers even offers dancing lessons for the occasion. When Lucas still isn't sure of himself, Rogers compares this current predicament to what Odette and Derek had to go through in the first movie. But I'm not Prince Derek. Still not over the status thing, huh? Meanwhile, Scully looks for clues in the sorceress's chamber in Cathay. The ghost has to sneakily look around and not draw the attention of the sorceress, which helps him find an inscription that could prove useful. The sorceress notices that Scully is here and tries to apprehend him. But right now, I'm just wondering what her motives are in creating that spell. Was she just obeying orders from the Emperor or doing this for herself? What exactly is she gaining from this? Anyway, Scully is trapped in a force field but does get away by the end. Back with Elise, she and Lee are horseback riding and spending some time alone while Lucas covertly tails them. The two royals actually get close to kissing a few times, but Lucas uses his blowgun to interrupt them both without being noticed. Not that it matters though, since Lee later confesses to Rue about falling in love with Elise. The prince is then scared that these feelings could get in the way of his original goal of winning the music competition. But Rue is pretty understanding about all this. Falling in love is never anyone's fault, Master Lee. But you must remember the promise you made to your father. I mean, you can do both. And actually, since you developed feelings for Elise, doesn't that make you want to try even harder to win? Speaking of Elise, she confronts Lucas after she finds his blowgun. Both are upset over how things have turned out. But for now, it's time for the next song, courtesy of Samar, voiced by Sharam Parabhakar. Do you wanna know why I light up the sky? Day or night, it doesn't matter, I fly so high. I throw these colors all around and they catch your eyes. So show your colors, show your colors, show your colors. And Jean Bob's reaction? That was a disaster. Yes, you have personality, but dogs have personality. <laughs> Uberta and Rogers countered that negativity by skewing Jean Bob's words to make it seem like he actually enjoyed the performance, which is a little clever. And the audience respond by bringing out the glow sticks. Well, I know what this calls for. <laughs> Scully finally reports his findings to Odette's party. They recreate the memorized inscription, and Maylee is horrified at what it says. Well, that sucks, but hey, you can always live with your dragon boyfriend. Just move to this kingdom where everyone can accept you two for who you are. Maylee tries exclaiming that she gave up true love, but as Scully notes, it doesn't work because her heart is feeling very differently from what she said. Shen decides to take matters into his own hands by leaving Mei Li forever and making her slowly forget him. And it's kinda heartbreaking. But with how much these moments get interrupted with the music competition story, it's kinda hard to maintain focus on the subject matter. I get that these two plots are connected because Li and Mei Li are siblings, but that's not enough of a common thread between what they're going through. One half of the story is about people willing to give up love for each other's freedom from evil, while the other half is about this love triangle that is pulling apart two childhood friends. Anyway, it's Lee's turn to perform, and he sings in Mandarin Chinese. <laughs> And okay, the songs in this are mostly good. They did get people from different cultures to sing and the animators did their best to convey their uniqueness. But this has nothing to do with some evil sorceress doing what Rothbart did before her. Unless she comes in and decides to interrupt the festival, this whole thing about Lee and Elise should have been its own separate story. Like... like... <sighs> exactly. Anyway, Lee's performance was so good that even Jean Bob was won over. He wins the competition, and Lucas, feeling that Elise's love is slipping away from him, takes up Rogers' help to learn how to dance, with Lee secretly watching them. Then be a man! 
and dance with me. You know, Richard, you could probably take this series in a bold direction by having two male characters together instead of joking about it, but Uberna decides to intervene by replacing Lucas's name in Elise's dance card with Prince Lee. Guess she thought that her adopted granddaughter made her choice in the love triangle. And Uberta's not wrong, since we see Elise taking Lee to Rogers' spy room to look at some gadgets from about two movies ago. But when Elise mentions Lucas's name over and over again, as she recalls her childhood adventures with him, Lee slowly realizes how much his rival means to her. Speaking of Lucas, he gets one last boost from Rogers in the form of a nice outfit. I thought you might like an updated outfit for the balls. Yours, Lord Rogers. Hashtag good luck. Hashtag you can do it. Hashtag win. Guys, this universe has no social media. The hashtag joke makes no sense. Hashtag not funny. So May Lee is moping now that Shen left her. She even faints when she almost catches him flying away. Everyone else prepares for the ball, and Lee can't stop thinking about what to do with Lucas and Elise. Speaking of Elise, she begins the ceremony by dancing with her adoptive father. Lee is supposed to dance with her next, but he lets Lucas dance in his place. The prince is going to sing for the two of them instead, and it's an English rendition of his song from the competition. Cause living without you is like living Without color, a lost lullaby. He seems to have accepted that those two are in love and decided not to get in the way of that. And because he is also the child of the Emperor, this fulfills the requirements for breaking the spell. Shen turns back into a human and shares an embrace with Mei Li, who was watching her brother sing from a distance. They can finally be together the way they want to. Don't even think about it. As the movie winds down, Elise thanks Lee for reminding her of her relationship with Lucas. Lee says his well wishes, Lucas shows up to take Elise away, and... Oh, I see. This is a two-part story. Well, that explains why this movie felt like it didn't amount to a whole lot. Oh sure, the song numbers were alright, and I was interested in this recreation of the first movie by having another couple affected by an evil spell, but they didn't really solve that problem because it's the other character from the other storyline who gets to do that. That's really the only way these plots connect in the end, and it's a tenuous connection at best. While there are some funny moments here and there, it felt more like a slog than usual to get through this, and the only real tension was whether or not Lucas and Elise would get together. The movie could even be boring sometimes, which wasn't something I felt for the other 3D movies given some of their interesting ideas. So the next one really has to surprise me if I'm going to get anything worthwhile from the two partner, which we'll see soon, because next time, we're invited to a royal wedding. Oh.